Well, I'm sure many of you know that um, yesterday, I believe it was, that Paris, France was uh, viciously, brutally attacked by mes- many uh, uh, Islamic militants shouting out Allah Akbar and, and indiscriminately shooting people, thinking that they are doing their God a service. Well, they actually, they are. It's Satan uh, that they're serving. And uh, so many people that are dead and um, the, the surviving families, um, they need our prayer. Uh, they need, if, if they don't know the true and living God, they certainly need to come to him. So let's pray. Father, we do lift up, uh, Lord, what we have seen yet again, just uh, the evil that is Islam, that is um, uh, telling people to go and kill people in the name of their false god, Allah. And, Lord, it just breaks our heart because you, the true and living God, you are love. Lord, you say twice in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. Uh, not hate, not evil, not, not world dominance with the sword, but one that tells us to go in the world and just preach the gospel and to love people into your kingdom. And Lord, we do pray for the survivors and those that are affected by such tragedies and such awful acts of evil. Lord, that you would um, please uh, come to their aid. Would you please rescue them? Would you please let them know that you love them? That this was never your intent. This was not your will. This was done according to the free will of evil men. And so, Lord, you are never to be blamed for the evil that happens because it's not you. It's people. And, Lord, even in our own lives, you're never to be blamed for you are holy and righteous and pure and perfect. And you tell us what to do. And then when we do our own thing and get into a mess, it's our fault, not yours. And so, Lord, we do lift up the people of France. I pray also you would give everyone in this fellowship an opportunity to tell somebody about the truth. Because, Lord, no doubt there are people out there that we know that are wondering what's going on, why this, why that, and, you know, all the the things that happen, uh, that people think when horrible things happen. Lord, we know the truth. We know you. Help us to share you with people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, just all full of happy news, aren't we, today? Let's open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we'll be reading verses 1 through 17, and then we'll look at it in detail. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, where we read, Then he, of course that's Jesus, spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he thought within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The Lord said, Hear what that unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, 
Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Hmm. Pretty important stuff, isn't it? Well, this morning we are looking at faith, which Jesus equates with childlike prayer. Faith, which Jesus equates with childlike prayer. Now, as you know, up to this point in Luke's gospel, he's approaching the city of Jerusalem, knowing that in not many days he would offer up himself on the cross as a full and complete payment for our sins. Now, as he approached Jerusalem, many people approached him, asking questions, wanting advice, wanting a touch, wanting a healing, wanting deliverance, many people coming to him. But each person had to wait their turn. Because at that point, Jesus was just in one man in one place. Fully God, but yet also fully man. And one place at one time. But he knew that the day was fast approaching when people wouldn't have to wait their turn to talk with him. Because after his death and resurrection, everyone at any time can have a personal conversation with Jesus. Therefore, in this chapter, Jesus took the time to teach his disciples about how we might commune with him in prayer. In this chapter, we're going to see that Jesus receives our prayers when we pray persistently, humbly, innocently, and with total dependence upon him for everything. And in verses 1 through 8, we're told, keep praying. Keep praying. How many of you say, oh, I've prayed about this thing for a long time, and yet God still hasn't answered my prayers? Anybody feel like that? No? You all get your... Okay, so okay. You honest people are raising your hand. Well, the answer short and sweet, but yet true, is keep praying. Keep praying. Notice in verse 1, he spoke a parable, a, 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 com- a story of a common occurrence to, that has an underlying spiritual meaning, speaks this parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And that's tough. You pray about something for a long time and it doesn't happen. It's easy to lose heart. You know, just last night, wanting to just commune with nature. It's all I was doing, just out there in the woods, wanting just to have a little commune with nature. Lord, would you please bring a deer by that I might commune with nature, get in touch with that you know, primal instinct and all. And, and the Lord, I prayed about it. And then the night came along and it got dark and I had to leave. And I, I was sad. I was depressed. And I'm like, oh, man. Ugh. So anyway, we ought to pray and not lose heart. Whether the deer come or not. Right? No, notice, though, in this parable, it's interesting. Right from the very beginning, Jesus tells us the purpose of this parable. He gives us the answer. He gives us the moral lesson, and it's this. We always ought to pray and not lose heart. Why? Why does he always want us to pray? Well, a lot of reasons. Number one, Jesus loves us, and he even likes us, and he just wants to spend time with us. Some people will say, well, you know, why should I pray? God knows what I need before I ask. Well, Why should I talk with my wife ever? She knows how I feel. She knows what I want. So why do I ever have to talk with her? Well, the short answer is because she wants me to. And the the good answer on my part is because I also want to. (laughs) All right. Yeah, yeah. That's what you call recovery right there. Yeah. So... I want to, and she, we just want, it's not that we have our agendas that we have to get accomplished, and that's the only reason. Well, you know, when we have an agenda, when I got needs, I'll come to you and give you my petitions and spit them out as quickly as I can, and then it's up to you to meet my needs. That would be weird. That would be odd. And yet, as a believer, I don't want to be weird and odd with the Lord. The only time I come to Him is when I have a list of, of, of wants and needs, and spit it out to him and then go my merry way and do my own thing without taking time to stop and and listen and just a fellowship so number 1 we ought to pray always why because number 1 Jesus likes you and he simply wants to talk with you hang out with you also 
Number two, prayer is never, ever a waste of time. It is always, always beneficial. Have you ever gotten up from a time of prayer and thought, wow, that was a waste. I wish I would have watched TV instead. No, you never feel that. It's always, always beneficial on many, many levels, even when it seems like our prayers are, no, are going no higher than the ceiling. In the following parable, Jesus encourages us to persevere in prayer, even when it seems that heaven is silent. We ought always to pray and not lose heart. This is what the parable now, verse 2. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. If you've ever had any dealings with the legal system, you person, I know where that city is. I know who that judge is, you know. So just this, this, this fictional character, some judge does not believe in God, nor does he care about people. He was a heartless, godless judge. Now there was a widow, some you know, again, this, this made-up character, a widow in the city. She came to him, the heartless, godless judge, and said, Get justice for me from my adversary. Apparently, there was some evildoer that had taken advantage of this poor widow. You know, there are people out there that are purposefully targeting the elderly to take advantage of them. I just can't believe that, that people can be so low. Well, to take advantage of anybody is just absolutely wrong, but especially to target the vulnerable, the weak. It's just awful. Well, in this story that Jesus is, this parable he's telling, he says there was this widow and there was this evil guy that had done her wrong, and she could not avenge herself, so she took her case to court. But then she wound up at the bench of a godless, heartless Judge, he didn't care about her, and he certainly wasn't in any hurry to to help her out. Verse 4, and while he would not for a while, he blew her off. Court delays, recesses, continuations, legal maneuvers, you know, just like what we see today. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me because she's a pain in the neck she's a burr under my saddle for you cowboys i know you know what that means she troubles me i will avenge her lest because if i don't by her continual coming she will weary me she's gonna wear me out you know like a child who won't take no for an answer your parents have any of them kids won't take no for an answer. Remember, we had the ongoing joke in my family when my boys were young. I said, what does no mean? And they said, well, it means beg me some more. Okay, well, at least you're honest, you know. Beg me some more. And man, kids can do that. But then I wonder, how often do I act like that toward God? God says, no, and I beg him some more. But Lord, what about this? What about that? How about if I get what I really want and I keep asking and keep bugging you and keep pestering you and keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. I'm reminded of what God said about Israel when they wandered through the wilderness. God gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. And I wonder if I've ever done that, where I've worn God out over something and finally God says, fine, you can have it, but you're going to see that it wasn't the best for you and it's going to wear you out in the long run. So be careful what you're begging for. You just may get it. And so when I pray, I'm always praying, but Lord, your will be done. And if the door is shut, I don't try to get a crowbar and pry it open anymore. Oh, I have. Only to find something scary on the other side. (laughs) And I don't want to do that anymore. So if the door's shut, I leave it shut. If the Lord wants it open, the Bible says he's, he's the Lord who shuts and no one opens and opens and no one can shut. So just let it go. And pray, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Your will be done. So, this this woman, bugging, 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 bugging the judge. And finally, to save his sanity, he gave in to her request. And the Lord said, now Jesus is saying, now hear what that unjust judge said. I want to just give her her request to get rid of her. Now, Jesus is not saying... 
Therefore, your heavenly father is like him. Keep bugging him, and then finally he'll give you what you want just so that you'll quit pestering him. That's not what he's saying. Notice, shall not God avenge his own elect? See, what was this woman to this judge? Nothing but a pain in the neck. What are you to the Lord? You're his elect. You're his child. You've been adopted into his family because of your faith in Jesus. You're part of his body. You are the bride of Christ. Now, if my wife comes to me and says, somebody's bothering me, them's fighting words. I'm going to go after that person. So any of you bother Amanda, you're, in, you know, you're going to have me and my sons to face, okay? Rock on, Daniel. Rock on. Uh, absolutely. That's just family. And we're not, I'm, I would never say to, okay, come on, honey, just, just don't bother me with that. Can't you see I'm busy watching the Packers beat up on whoever they're playing? Can't you see that I'm a little engaged in other things? I would never do that. I would come to her aid now as any good husband should do. Shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he, this is interesting, though he bears long with them, though God puts up with us. And he does, doesn't he? He's had to with me. These several 30, almost 40 years of walking with him. And then in verse 8, he says, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Again, Jesus isn't comparing the godless, heartless judge to our loving, patient, heavenly father. Jesus is not saying that God is some disinterested deity who will only give in to those who badger him. But contrary to the godless, heartless judge, our God who cares so much for us and is so interested in our well-being promises That when we call to him for deliverance from the enemy, he will avenge us speedily. Now, you might say, but I've been praying for something and it doesn't seem speedily. It seems slowly. It's not happening. Does it ever seem that God's timetable is different from yours? (laughs) Absolutely. Am I speaking truth here? Yes. It is, it is so true that it seems that God's timetable is different from our timetable. But you know what it really boils down to? Agendas. What do I mean by that? I'm glad you asked. See, here's the deal. God's agenda is many times different from my agenda. See, I look at my life, I look at my issues, and I, I got to have this, I got to have that, and Lord, you got to hurry up because this is due and that has to happen But God's agenda is not necessarily knocking off my to-do list. I want my circumstances to change, but God wants to first change my heart. That's His agenda. I've come to believe that the greatest goal in prayer is not to change God's will or to get things done. But the greatest goal of prayer is to change my heart. See, God has a will. God has a purpose. And if I'm praying not according to His will, even if I think it absolutely is, but it's not happening, something's going on in my heart. And God wants to change something in me. Desires, wants, wishes. But I find that as I pray, my will starts to be conformed to His will. And when my will does then get in line with God's will, it's then that God will answer our prayers according to His will. In 1 John chapter 5, now this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, oh, that's so important to know. Not just ask anything, but if we ask something according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, Whatever we ask, if it's according to his will, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So I know this is according to his will, and I've been praying about it for 20 years, and it hasn't happened. Well, at that point, I, I have to lovingly just suggest, let God be true, but every man a liar. In other words, it's not God's will for you to have that. Because if you were praying according to his will, you would have had it. 
That's how it's been in my life, and God changes my heart. And, and he, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but God wants me to be content. Content with such things as I have. He even says that in, in 1 Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You brought nothing in this world. It is certain you will carry nothing out. And with food and clothing, with these we shall be, we shall be content. Food and clothing. You've been fed today. you got meals ahead of you today. You have clothes on. Thank God. So, we're good, right? With these we shall be... It, and and it's, it's a matter of the will. Our will. Uh, I don't feel content. Well, start feeling content. You can't just feel... Yes, you can. God says you can, therefore you can. If God tells me to be content, then I can be content because God would never tell me to do something that I couldn't do. Through the power of the Spirit, I can say, okay, I'm content. I'm going to stop whining about what I want. I'm just going to say thank you for what I have and leave it at that. Godliness with contentment. Great gain. That's, oh, that's greater gain than some multimillionaire trying to achieve another million. Somebody with a 2013 car trying to go trade in for a 2016 car. Great con- godliness, food and clothing. Oh, man, I'm, I'm fat, I'm happy, I'm warm, I'm good. You know? The end. <laughs> now, I do recognize sometimes what I am praying for isn't according to God's will. So, He will wait until my will conforms to His. And then He answers my prayer. So that's one of the big points here. God loves you. And God promises that when we call out to him for deliverance from the enemy, which is always according to his will, he will deliver us. A couple other points to this parable. Number one, we have an adversary who's ruthless, heartless. And he will seek to do us harm, especially if we're weak and vulnerable. Just like that widow had an adversary, In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober. Not just don't get drunk, but be sober-minded as well. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Be careful. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Does the lion go to attack the big stud bull of the herd? Or does he go after the sickly calf? He goes after the easy pickings. We are told to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And Jesus is giving us a huge key how to be strong in the Lord. He wills that men ought to pray always and not lose heart. Prayer, prayer, prayer. No substitute for prayer. No shortcuts. You know, we live in a day of shortcuts, simplifications, instant gratification. I like some popcorn. Do you guys, any of you... Old enough like me, remember the day you put oil in the fry pan and then turn up the heat and put one kernel of corn in the fry pan and you'd wait for that one to pop. Then you put in a big handful of them, put a lid on and you'd shake it back and forth for five hours. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Yeah. That's old school right there, you youngins. What do you do today? Oh, a bag, microwave, boop, push one button. There's even popcorn button on the, on the microwave. And in th- a few minutes, you got popcorn. Lazy. <laughs> the internet has all but replaced the need for libraries. Li- what good are libraries? You got the internet. You can got you know iBooks and Nook and don't need libraries anymore. Also, you can get on an airplane, fall asleep, and in a few hours you wake up halfway around the world. How'd that happen? And because of these and many, many other time-saving inventions, we Christians sometimes fall into the trap of assuming there are shortcuts to spiritual maturity and holiness. Oh, I just read this book and then I'll be really, this, this little pamphlet on holiness and now I'll be holy. Read this pamphlet on prayer and then I'll be a prayer warrior. <laughs> Now, how's that working for us? Uh, there are no shortcuts with God. The only way 
to spiritual growth and well-being is through lots and lots of prayer. And lots and lots of his word. Not books about his word. And we're going to touch on this tonight as we're getting back to basics. There are some wonderful books out there, but no book on this planet was ever intended to take the place of the Bible or to replace our time in simply the Bible. So, so the Lord says he will avenge us speedily. We pray according to his will. We're praying for deliverance from the enemy. Yes, it's going to be done. But notice again in verse 7 the phrase, though he bears along with them. Ugh. You know, I can honestly testify to the fact that God has borne long with me. And yet he's never, ever said, I'm done with you. I praise the Lord for his unbelievable patience toward me. I can well relate to Psalm 103, verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Fear the Lord. Fear God. His mercy toward you higher than the heavens. God has been patient and merciful. And he delights, as we've been talking about, praying according to his will, delights to deliver us from the enemy. And so he bears along with us. He does. And then in verse 8 at the end, kind of the same, same feeling. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... He's going to come for his bride. He's also going to come to establish his kingdom on the earth. But when he comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Wow, that's a scary question. We're living in a day where godlessness abounds. God has been removed from every place in the public realm, in the schools, even from earliest in preschool. Books on dinosaurs. Billions and billions of years ago, there was a big bang. Totally removing God from everything. This is a compelling question. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Faith. Well, let's define faith. What is faith? We know in Hebrews, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's substantive. There is something tangible associated with faith. In other words, faith doesn't just believe that God's Word is true, but faith also does God's Word. That's the evidence. I believe that the Bible is true, therefore I have faith. When Jesus said, when he comes, will he find faith? Well, he's not just looking for people who believe the right things about him. He even said the demons believe and they tremble. Why? Because they know the right things about God, but they don't do what God says. They're not doers of the word. And there are many people, James warns us, be doers of the word, not hearers only. It's one thing to know that Jesus is Lord, but it's another thing entirely to know him as Lord. Yes, Jesus is Lord, but is he your Lord? And that's the big question here. Now, Jesus is speaking of prayer, is he not, in this, in this parable? And then he summarizes it. He says, when he comes, is he going to find faith? Prayer and faith here are equated. He's he's linking them together. So my takeaway as I try to put these pieces of the puzzle together is this. If I believe that prayer is something that Jesus has called me to and that prayer is important, then by faith, I will pray. It's not faith, not true biblical living faith to say, yes, prayer is important and then not pray. That's pretend. And so here he says, pray. When he returns, will he find us praying? That's the big issue. When Jesus returns, will he find Calvary Chapel Bartlett being a praying people? Jesus said to the religious rulers on two occasions there on the Temple Mount, he cleansed it twice, once early in the ministry, once later on at the end. 
He drove out the money changers and all. And he screamed out, it is written. He screamed. He yelled. He was mad. He made a, a, a whip out of a bunch of cords and began to drive the people and the, and the animals out. He was overturning tables. Imagine somebody coming in here and overturning the tables and making a whip and get out of here, you bunch of snakes. He, he called them brood of vipers. And what did he yell out? It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. You're using religion to try to rake money from the people. But the first part is something we need to listen to. It is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. In other words, the houses that Jesus identifies with, he's related to, are praying houses. People who pray. I pray that we, Calvary Chapel Bartlett, will be a house of prayer. You know, beginning tonight, 6.30, each night we're having a work week of prayer. It's only five nights. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Monday through Thursday, it begins at 7, having a work week of prayer. We're going to come together to spend time with Jesus. That's it. We're going to look at some scriptures that talk to us about prayer and about aligning our hearts right. About coming back to that place of simple faith and trust and dependency and enjoyment with the Lord. And I hope you can make it each and every night. But if you can't make it each and every night, I hope that you'll try to at least make one. Make as many as you can. Come on out just to fellowship with the Lord. One of the nights we'll have communion. Um, I'm, I'm really look, we've done it before. I'm looking forward to this. But again, Jesus said, my house is a house of prayer. So we're going to be his house. In, Jesus is in the house. Therefore, God's people pray. Now, when people pray, the next question is, who does God listen to? Verses 9 through 14. Who is God listening to? Verse 9, he also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So now this parable is interesting because Jesus is aiming it to specific people that were in the crowd listening to him that day. Specifically, the religious rulers, a group of them known as the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ultra-right-wing, ultra-conservative, legalistic, hyper-holier-than-thou people. And... uh, No fun to be around, (laughs) to say the least. So he speaks these parables to them. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Oh, the Jewish men who became tax collectors were despised by their Jewish brethren. Because they were serving the enemy. They were in league with Rome. And so now Jesus, and he tells this parable, and the Pharisees are thinking, oh, the Pharisees, a good guy, tax collector, a bad guy, boo, you know. That's what they're thinking. And then the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners. I don't do these bad things. And it's commendable. He didn't do these bad things. The problem was he credited himself for not doing the bad things where he should have been crediting God's grace for keeping him from the bad things. He says, I, 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 I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, or an adulterer, or no, even as this tax collector. Can you imagine coming to prayer fellowship and somebody saying, Lord, I thank you that I'm so good, and unlike that guy sitting two rows behind me? That'd be funny, wouldn't it? That'd be awkward. That'd be, that'd be arrogant. How arrogant of that man. I'm better than that guy. Uh. But notice in verse 11, it's kind of comical. Jesus said the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He's praying not to God. God's not listening. He's only praying to himself. He's bragging about himself to himself because the Lord is not listening. When someone thinks that they're better than others, they're praying 
only with themselves. And by the way, let me point out, there's a more deadly sin than extortion, unjust, adulterer, or even being an IRS agent. There, there are worse sins than that. You know what the worst sin is? Spiritual pride. Thinking that God owes you a place in heaven because you've been a good girl or a good boy. That is, that is damnable. That's what got Satan kicked out of heaven. Lucifer, the, the anointed angel that covered, I will ascend above the other stars of heaven. I will be like God thinking he was all that. And the Lord said, no, you didn't. And cast him down to earth. He's the devil. So pride, worse than these other sins. You know, it's interesting. Again, he, all he accomplished in his prayer was bragging to himself about himself, but one thing he didn't accomplish in prayer was touching the heart of God. Verse 12, he talks about how wonderful spiritual he is. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Hey, great work. But why are you bragging about it? Why do you think that somehow, some way, that buys you a stairway to heaven? None, those, those things don't matter. Our righteousnesses, as Isaiah says, are filthy rags in his sight. If we're trying to approach God based on our good works and our wonderful deeds, the Lord says, oh, get those stinky, filthy rags out of my sight. He won't accept it. So this Pharisee prayed with himself, bragging on himself about what he did and what he didn't do. Verse 13, the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. The Pharisee approached God on the basis of his self-righteousness. The tax collector approached God on the basis of God's mercy. Who touched God's heart that day? Tax collector. I tell you, verse 14, this man, speaking of the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Here's a big lesson of the parable. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. We can approach God on one of two bases. Number one, self-righteousness, or number two, God's grace. And it can't be both. The cults, the, the, the Mormon religion, Jehovah's Witness religion, will say that we're saved by God's grace coupled with our good works. As one Mormon missionary told me, he said, God's grace, no, our, excuse me, our works take us so far and then God's grace takes us the rest of the way. I said, really? What does Romans chapter 11 verse 6 say? If it's by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. The word grace means basically loosely translated getting what you don't deserve, not what you've earned and achieved up to a certain point. If, it, if it's uh, by grace, it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If it's of works, then it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So we can approach God on the basis of our works, like the Pharisee, or on the basis of God's grace, like the tax collector. But God hears the prayers of the sinner, the one approaching God on his grace. He doesn't hear the prayers of the self-righteous. So humility, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In prayer, so important. But in addition to having a humble heart, Jesus then declared the necessity of having an innocent mind. Verses 15 through 17, we read about childlike faith. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. To to do what rabbis and even uh, other uh, Catholic Priests and Protestant ministers will many times do. Touch a child, pray over them. That's what they're wanting Jesus to do. You know, here at Calvary Chapel Bartlett, uh, we dedicate children to the Lord. We don't do infant baptism or, or young, young child baptism because we see in Scripture there is a necessity for repentance and then be baptized. 
And so when a person, young person, finally comes to the decision that they want Jesus to be their own Savior and Lord, where it's no longer the, the Jesus of my parents, but now I want him to be my Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, that's the point where water baptism has its full uh, wonderful meaning because baptism is the death, burial, and resurrection of a person. Just like Jesus died and was buried and then rose from the dead, baptism is us, is us identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Death to the old self. Well, how do you tell the three-year-old, you need to die to yourself? Ah! You know, make him pray that terrifying prayer. You know, that horrible, terrifying Scary prayer, then now I lay me down to sleep. You know the line, and if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Good night, little Jimmy. You're going to maybe die. I don't know, but trust Jesus. Good night. Click, lights up. Ah! Yeah, good job. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Appreciate that and the extra therapy I had to go through. So we don't baptize little babies or little little children who don't understand, but we certainly do dedicate them. If you have a child that you want dedicated on a Sunday morning, bring them on up here. We will pray for them, dedicate them to the Lord, pray for you that you'll be parents that will encourage them in their spiritual walk. So that's what was happening here with Jesus. When the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. They told the parents, hey, can't you see Jesus is busy? He doesn't have time to bother with those irritating, noisy, non-tithing kids. So get him out of here. (laughs) But Jesus called them and said to them, let the little children. In the old King James, I believe it says, suffer the little children. Compel them. I want them. Those are the ones I really, really want. Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Wow. How? How are little kids kind of compared to very much like the kingdom of God? Well, number one, for the most part, they're very teachable. Young kids are very teachable. They haven't experienced years of being scathed by our sinful society, so they have a natural trust that their parents and their teachers are telling them the truth. They're teachable. Which is why it's so important to teach children about Jesus at their earliest age. And why we here place such a great emphasis upon our children's ministry. Teaching them the Bible at their age-appropriate level. It is amazing and wonderful to see all the hard work and the effort that is going into our children's ministry. The money that is being spent is worth every penny. And we are excited about that and we want to see it continue because it's it's vital. This is the age where they're open, where they're teachable. But in addition to teaching children, it is also important for us to become teachable like children. Notice verse 17. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Childlike faith is required to enter God's kingdom, meaning we take God's word at face value and then do what it tells us to do. There are a lot of people who promote themselves as being very well educated biblically and lots of initials after their names and all. And they will tell you that the Bible is to be taken more figurative than literal. They'll say that all the Bible, just, it's, it's, it's not about Christ Jesus per se. It's about a Christ consciousness, adopting his teachings and all, but not, you know, let's not get carried away. And they will use $3 words to explain why the Bible really doesn't mean what it says, but it means more what they say. Beware of them. Little children are not capable of comprehending abstract concepts like allegory and symbolism. Little children are simpler than that. If you tell a child that Jesus loves them and they need to believe in Him in order to go to heaven, no child would ever say, well, do you really mean I need to adopt a Christ-like consciousness instead of submitting to a literal Christ? Is that what you're saying? No, it's only the smart guys in the cemeteries, seminaries 
Who would dare say such stupidity? Jesus tells us that unless we receive the kingdom of God as little children, we will not enter it. And since a child would absolutely take what their parents say at face value, even so, we need to take what Jesus says in his word at face value. And then pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth and be doers of the word, not hearers only. Okay, to summarize, at this point, we've seen that if we want to approach Jesus, we do so by praying with an attitude of persistence, humility, and childlike innocence. Knowing, number one, that our Heavenly Father isn't like some unjust judge who's bothered by our burdens. But to the contrary, God loves us. And He's able and willing and eager to answer us speedily, delivering us from the enemy. Now, in the next section of Scripture... We're going to see that if, a Jesus, that if a person wants to know Jesus and walk with him, then he must or she must be willing to forsake all. See, Jesus is the only door that leads to eternal life, and that door is narrow. Requiring that we leave our worldly baggage behind, or we won't be permitted to enter in. So next week, we're going to pick up on verse 18, where we'll read about, Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler. I encourage you to read ahead. Shall we stand and pray? Father, Father in heaven, oh, hallowed be thy name. We praise you for who you are, all that you've done, are doing and have promised to do because your promises are sure they're going to happen. We thank you, Lord, that we can approach you, that you receive us, provided we will not come arrogantly, but we come to you on the basis of your mercy and your grace. We come to you, Lord, not with our righteousness, but through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed to cleanse us from our sins and to raise us even from the dead spiritually that we might have new life in you. And Lord, you know the enemy's all over us. You know the enemy has many plans for each and every one of us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would avenge us. Lord, we pray that we would pray. We ask God that you would help us to come to you more often. Lord, to free up our lives. We are so busy and then we lay on ourselves more things to do. Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to lay aside the things that really don't matter and then take up the things that do. And I pray, Lord, that this time of, uh, of prayer, these next few days, would spark a revival in every heart and, and that would, would then burn brightly in this community. Lord, because there are many people that don't have a real relationship with you. They know that Jesus is Lord, but they don't know that Jesus as their Lord. And so, Lord, I, we, we do pray that you would help us to burn brightly. And if we're all but out, Lord, we know you'll fan us to flame. If we get back to basics, seeking your face, you will fan us into flame. And so, Lord, thank you for this time in your word. Again, we lift up the people in France and all over the world that are being terrorized by the evil that is being done. And, um, Lord, that's not you. We pray that you come quickly, that you would fix all the mess that is here. And, um, Father, that you're, you would somehow, some way, Reveal yourself to those that are hurting and suffering. And Lord, maybe even use us. You might want to send somebody from this fellowship over to France. Preach the gospel to them. Lord, your will be done. Thank you for this time. We trust that you will be with us as we go from this place, knowing you'll never leave us nor forsake us. I pray you'd also put a burden in our hearts for those that don't know you, that are not walking with you. And that we would speak up and tell them the truth. 
And bring them in, Lord, to hear your word. And in all these things, spoken and unspoken, we lift up our requests to you. And we pray, not our will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's kids said, Amen. Amen.